We are right. Hi, everyone. My name is Jordan Frias, and I'm with the Society of Professional Journalists. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, sorry again for the technical difficulties. Um, uh, today we have with us uh, Brian McGorry. Uh, he is the editor of the Boston Globe. Uh, I'm going to just read a little bit about him before we begin. So let me just get to that, okay? All right. One second. Thank you so much again, Mr. McGorry, for being here. I appreciate it. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. And again, I appreciate your flexibility with all the technology. We're for bearing with us. I appreciate that. So yes. I like to see somebody else screws up technology too. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, so um, so yeah, so um, so it looks like uh, Brian McGorry was uh, you know born in Boston. Uh, graduated from Weymouth North High School, the Bates College in 84, uh, worked for the Patriot Ledger, and then he went to New Haven Register where he worked for the, as a Washington correspondent, was that right? Yes. Then he came to Boston in 89, uh, covering the South Shore, covered the mayoral campaign for Thomas Menino. Uh, looks like he worked uh, as a White House correspondent for Bill Clinton's uh, administration, and then came back to Boston in 98, and yes. in 2007, he became the paper's Metro editor. So does that sound about right, Brian? Anything you want to add? I became the editor in 2013. Okay, got it. Yes. Sorry about that. That's all right. It. Yeah, so, uh, so yeah, we'll just get right to it. Um, thank you again for being here today. Uh, first of all, I wanted just to ask, um, can you talk a little bit about how the day-to-day -day has changed since uh, the pandemic hit and when you guys started moving out of the offices? Sure, it's, um, it's changed completely in every way. And if Jordan, for some reason I tune out, just give me a wave so you know, so I know you can't hear me or something, but um, um, it's changed in every way. It, uh, that first week of March, sort of the whole world changed for everybody, the, the globe included. Um, a couple of key ways. Um, first, the entire story uh, became the coronavirus pandemic. And every single thing we did um, and have done, with a few small exceptions, has been all about covering this massive, sprawling public health story, healthcare delivery story, economic story, education story, sports story, art story. Everything in our civic life, everything in our country, literally became about the coronavirus and COVID-19. So reporters, editors, um, graphic designers, graphic artists, all had to learn on the fly about this story. And everybody devoted themselves to it, and it's been really impressive to see. At the same time, just like virtually every other company uh, in Massachusetts, we had to do this remotely. Uh, we had never done anything like this before. Uh, there was a Thursday, first week of March, where we were trying a practice uh, run, um, having everybody work outside of the newsroom. And starting that day, we pretty much ordered everybody to stay out of the newsroom with but a few exceptions. I stayed there for a couple of weeks, uh, but then even I started working at home. And we did that for a couple of reasons. One, we didn't want to put our staff at risk of getting the uh, the infection, and two, we didn't want to be carrying the infection out into the world and risk exposing other people by our work. So for the last, what, seven, eight weeks, uh, we've all been working remotely, uh, covering, you know, probably the most consequential story of our career. So it's been, you know, a lot of change on a lot of fronts very, very quickly. Yeah, so I've uh, I've seen you. You've been uh, doing a couple of Zoom events uh, for you know new subscribers for journalism students. I've heard you on Boston Public Radio. So I heard you mention this as one of the biggest stories of our lifetime, besides uh, the Marathon bombing and 9/11. Can you talk about how how that is and what's different between that time and this time? So it's a good question. When you think about a major news story, um, more often than not, and a lot more often than not. It involves a single massive precipitating event and then an aftermath. So when you think about you know, a mass shooting or even 9-11, uh, there was an attack in 9-11, there was an attack on America uh, that unfolded over the course of a couple of hours. 
and then it was many years worth of um, uh, coverage afterward. But the difference here is that there is no one precipitating event. It's um, it's a series of battles against, you know, the president calls it the invisible enemy. Other people call it different things, but it's a sprawling news story that spills into every part of our lives. And there's not one event, it's a series of unfolding or cascading events across weeks, months, and some people argue maybe a couple of years. So that alone is much more taxing on a news organization. It's much more taxing on a journalist who's trying to cover it. Uh, and it, it, you know, it causes your decision making as to what you cover, what you don't, how you cover it to be even more important because there's no beginning, middle and end. This thing is, you know, this thing is unformed in so many ways. So where do you see the, sto the story going? I noticed, I remember one time you said uh, to somebody that you see this going from a public health story to a financial, economic and business story. Can you talk more about the future of this coverage? Well, it's always been both. Um, uh, you know, and quite literally, it's it's always been a massive public health story. Uh, it, it, you know, that is essentially what it is at its absolute core. People are dying. Thousands and thousands of people are dying right here in our own state. So more than anything else, it's a public health story. It's also a story about healthcare delivery and how we can make sure that we live up to our reputation as being, you know, the capital of healthcare delivery in the country, if not the world and how other places like New York and Italy and Spain can do the same thing um, and treat people, make you know, as many people better as possible. But it's also a story of economic hardship. Uh, within days of this really hitting America, uh, our stock market fell by upwards of 25%. Uh, we've seen an unemployment rate spike from record lows to unprecedented highs. Uh, people are out of work, people are um, you know, seeing the ravages of uh, a, a deep recession that was basically like a car hitting a wall. I've heard this said again and again without ever hitting the brakes. And we're not used to that here in the United States. This is, this doesn't have precedent. Um, and as this goes on and we get the public health aspect under control, assuming we do and we will, uh, it still will remain uh, an enormous economic story. In fact, it will move or morph into more of an economic story as it unfolds. And I think we're just at the beginning of seeing that happen now is more questions are being asked about how we spur the economy, how we reignite the economy as we're seeing the rates of infections drop and the rates of death drop. So when you talk about the economy, I think about, I can't help but think about next Monday, the state's supposed to reopen. Uh, can, can you, is the Boston Globe going to be part of that reopening? Can you talk a little bit more about when you guys plan to go back into the office? Yeah, no, absolutely not. Um, and you've heard the governor say that Monday doesn't represent, uh, you know, a starting gun getting fired and everybody immediately returns to work in bulk. And I don't know of any company that is saying you know, Monday's a day we're all going to file back in our offices uh, um, or, you know, oftentimes factory floors or whatever. I think that you will see uh, uh, in significant ways the wisdom of crowds in the maturity of who we are. And I think people will intentionally, um, uh, hopefully, but I, I believe this will happen, take it slow. Um, we have some major issues in front of us, like public transportation and how people feel safe getting back and forth from uh, their work. Um, there are still uh, high infection rates um, and there is still quite a bit of death. So I think the governor is right. It's not like firing a, a starting gun and everybody runs back to work. We don't plan at the globe to go back to work into the newsroom. And when I say go back to work, we are working. People are working, but we don't plan to go back to the newsroom until probably mid-August at the earliest. Um, and we need to feel safe on the MBTA before we do that. So I think what you're going to see is um, what the governor wants and what uh, infectious disease specialists want. And that is a phased in opening where uh, there'll be a gradual return to the tired or trite phrase of a new normal or a new abnormal 
you'll start to see restaurants be able to accept uh, uh, some dine-in customers. You'll see dentists working. You'll see uh, baseball games or sport events uh, getting played without crowds. You'll see, hopefully, hair salons uh, or nail salons opening soon, uh, that kind of thing. And I think, you know, in many ways, it's not going to be the government that dictates the pace of play here. It's just going to be the practicality of the populace that decides when they feel safe uh, doing the things that we used to do. And I think you need to see infection rates and death rates drop significantly before that happens. So you mentioned the governor. I know you used to cover the White House. Can you talk a little bit about how it's been with him versus how the president has been handling this uh, crisis? Well, being a governor right now, uh, being any sort of public figure right now, being the mayor, the governor, the president, these are hard jobs. I mean, no, nothing would have prepared anybody in public life in the United States or anywhere else in the world uh, for a global pandemic. Um, there's no playbook for this. Uh, there are a lot of science fiction movies and the like, but there's no playbook, um, uh, especially one that has visited upon our shores in the way that this one has. So. These people have really, really challenging jobs and um, they're learning on the fly. Um, you know, everybody in life, um, it's easy to look back and say, why didn't we do this then? But this thing came upon us so fast uh, and so furiously that nobody could have anticipated it. So, you know, the governor has won uh, really broad support among the voters of Massachusetts. Um, um, you know, we polled, other places have polled, WBUR has polled, we polled with WGBH uh, very recently. I think the governor's support was, um, I may have this wrong, but I think it was 84% uh, favorability rating on how he's handled this crisis. That's huge. I think the mayor has gotten um, a, a very high rating as well. Um, you know, we've quibbled with some of the actions of the state. And actually, it's more than a quibble. We've um, taken exception to some of the lack of transparency that has unfolded at the state level. Um, I don't think it was done or is being done out of malice. I think people are just getting you know, used to what it's like to deal with a crisis like this. But they have changed on the fly. They are releasing more information. We wish they'd release more information still because it's really valuable to the public. Um, at the national level, um, I mean, I, I, I'm hard pressed to tell you about what's unfolding at the White House. I mean, you see it every day. Um, not every day now because he's, the president has stopped doing his daily briefings, but it's, um, uh, that too has no precedent, uh, the crisis or his response. And I think you're seeing the opposite happen at the national level. I think the president's approval ratings, which initially spiked at the very beginning of this crisis, have fallen significantly since. I think people don't feel like he's got as strong a handle on this as they wish they did. And I think that um, uh, we're, we're reverting to that kind of tired playbook of division uh, and sowing bad feelings among different groups, um, uh, you know, with an accent on partisanship here that's uh, Pretty unfortunate at the moment. And I noticed that you mentioned you had um, talked about uh, record readership and uh, record subscriptions. Uh, so what do you what do you think that why do you think that is? Uh, I know you guys have been doing some things different. Like you have the you know the mechanic now. You have like the comfort zone set of names. What what do you attribute these this rise of writer of readership and engagement with? Well, at a very basic level. Um, it's what we've been talking about. We've got a story of epic proportions and it's unprecedented and people wanted as much information about it as they could possibly get. And we, um, I guess there's a fine line between um, uh, pride and uh, conceit, but I think we're a pretty reputable and reliable source of news in, in this region. And so people turn to us in droves. We are seeing the first few weeks uh, quadruple the traffic that we normally see on our website. It was enormous. We'd seen, we were seeing numbers at the likes of which we'd never seen before. And that includes coverage of the uh, Boston Marathon bombings. Um, uh, it was all day, it was through the night, um, and it returned every single day. And so that was really gratifying. But look, initially part of it was because we were considered a reliable source of information. I'd like to think that a good part of it was then 
that people realize that the Globe was delivering uh, a very good news report every day. I'm really proud of what uh, the Globe staff has done day in and day out under extreme conditions. And um, uh, I think that helped us uh, sustain that kind of readership. I know it helped us convert a lot of readers into subscribers. Um, we now have over 200,000 digital subscribers, um, digital only subscribers to the Globe, which uh, only the, you know, aside from the national papers, the Post and the Times, only the LA Times has more, but our subscribers actually pay a lot more for a subscription. So we're really proud of that, that people felt that our report, our digital report was worth paying for, and they did. How have things changed on the digital front? Because, um, so I actually worked at the Globe for a little bit on the, on the web production team. How, how, have things changed on the website or changed in the papers, the print side? Has anything changed to make things different or? Um, meaning, I'm sorry. Um, maybe the look or maybe like, I know for example, one of the things is you got rid of the name section and put the comfort zone. You want to talk about things like that maybe? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So we did a lot of um, important, uh, but somewhat subtle things. You know, there wasn't a need for a name section anymore because there weren't really celebrities or gossip uh, going around. Everybody was stuck at home. So our living editors really smartly uh, devised um, uh, something called the comfort zone, which is more about living at home and what to do at home. And uh, that's done very, very well. Uh, I mean, on the website, um, I'd like to think that we're really, really fast out of the blocks on, on news right now on our website. We devote uh, an enormous proportion of our energy and our intellectual capital on our website as compared to our print paper. We are acutely aware that people are turning to our website uh, literally you know, uh, uh, every minute, every hour of the day. So we wanna make sure that we have as up-to-date information on that as possible, fresh stories, updating stories, fresh photography, graphics. And that is now um, our main emphasis. It's not like we don't care about the print paper. We do very, very much. Um, but we also know we quite, quite bluntly have more readers online and we are there to make sure that they're getting the freshest information possible. I actually had um, at one point, Marty Walsh, the mayor of Boston, called me up and said um, that he was on CNN doing an interview. He's been on CNN a lot. And he said before the interview was over, one of our web producers posted a story about what he was saying on CNN. And he called me to say, how the hell do you do that? You know, I'm still on CNN and you've got a story up about what I'm saying on CNN. It's really weird to see. But um, we really like to be in the moment online, and we think that's really important to sustaining a, a, a paying readership online. And I'll, I'll be remiss for asking you. So a lot of these uh, news organizations like the, the Times and the Washington Post have gotten rid of their paywall. What would you say to someone who's maybe uh, you know, turned off by the fact that there's still a paywall on these coronavirus stories? It's a legit question, Jordan. It's a good question. Um, so we made the decision early on to keep our paywall up. And uh, there are a lot of people I respect in this industry, a lot of really smart people who disagreed with that. Um, but I, uh, I and others uh, were pushing this for a few basic reasons. First and foremost, or not first and foremost, but first reason is uh, the Globe offers a lot of free information out there. Uh, our homepage is free to look at. Boston.com is a very good website. It's our sister website. That is free to look at. Uh, we own Stat News, which uh, is a website dedicated to the life sciences, which has done an exceptional job uh, covering the coronavirus pandemic. They have put all their uh, coronavirus news outside of their paywall, so you can get that for free. Um, second, um, our introductory rate is a dollar. If you're not a subscriber, all you have to do is pay a dollar and you get anywhere from four to six months for that buck. I would argue that if somebody is saying that we're not worth 12 cents a month or whatever it is, 15 cents a month, then why do they want to read us in the first place? Um, and third is um, we're in this for the long haul. Um, there is, this story is going to go on through the summer into the fall, maybe beyond. We need revenue at the Globe to sustain a powerful newsroom, to give people what they need to read. So in my view, 
the public service that the globe is doing is the journalism. It's not um, eviscerating our own revenue model to give stuff away for free in the short term. We need to be a sustainable news organization to cover stories like this and to cover the next big story that comes after this. And, you know, a couple of months in, I'm really, really happy with the, with the decisions that we made. And I think if you look around the industry, a lot of the news organizations that started out doing this are perhaps regretting that uh, they did go that route and that, um, you know, many are cutting significantly. I'm not saying the globe is immune to cuts. We did have a layoff outside of the newsroom last week. Uh, but I think we're in a stronger position because we have a higher digital uh, paying readership. That is All right, now I'm going to get some journalism questions because we have a lot of journalists here. So they want to know how, how this is being done. How are people reporting? What's changed? How do you make this happen? Um, are things not being able to get covered because of the virus? So there's nothing, and maybe I'm in glib here. I don't think I am. I don't know of anything that warrants coverage that's not coronavirus related that we're not covering. I don't think those things are existing right now. I mean, think about it. We're all cooped up in our houses um, uh, or apartments or wherever. And, um, you know, the court system has largely grind, ground to a halt. Um, crime is down for the most part. Um, you know, commerce is down. You know, it's every everything that seems to be unfolding except for you know, Flynn in uh, Washington getting um, uh, charges dropped against him seems to be related to the coronavirus. And so I'm not sitting here regretting that we've had to put all the staff on this huge story and stuff is, you know, exposing us that we're not covering. Um, to the question about how are we doing this? Um, was that the question? Yeah, just kind of like what, what, what systems did you have in place that made this possible to do remotely? So thank God. Um, and I really mean this, we put in a new content management system last year. Uh, we had this, and uh, I can't believe I even know about CMSs at this point in my life, but um, we had this content management system last year that was absolutely abysmal. Um, think of Apple and how predictive it is and how easy it is to use. We had a CMS that was the exact opposite, um, and it was really challenging, and you couldn't use it on the road. Uh, you couldn't use it remotely. Last year, we spent a couple of million dollars. We um, uh, bought a system from the Washington Post uh, called ARC, and it's a breeze to use remotely. I can read, um, I can get into the content management system of the globe on my iPhone. Um, I can use it on any device. And it has allowed us to um, really confidently work remotely. It's allowed web producers to do their work remotely. It's, um, it's been a godsend. And so that's been huge. Uh, obviously, Zoom has been a big deal. I mean, you know, you look back at the first weeks of this or the first days of this, and everybody was all excited learning this kind of, you know, remote meeting type of uh, setup. And it seemed novel and quaint at the time. And, um, you know, now everybody's completely sick of it, uh, um, uh, this meeting accepted. But, um, uh, uh, you know, we start the day off with uh, Zoom morning meetings. We have an 8.30 meeting every day we do by Zoom that we used to do in person. We have a 9.15 meeting by Zoom. We'll do a daily 12 p.m. meeting to catch up and a 2.30 print meeting. And those have worked really, really well. Um, uh, they've worked really well. And editors and reporters and photographers are constantly in touch by Slack and text and email and phone. Um, uh, you know, it's worked well for the most part. The human aspect of it, I think, has been really challenging, but the journalism aspect has worked really well. Can you talk more about the human human aspect of it? I mean, what's being lost about being in a physical room with somebody? Well, I mean, at a few levels. Um, a newsroom, and you've worked in a newsroom, Jordan, you know, you've worked in the Globe newsroom. Uh, a newsroom is a really special place. It's um, filled with incredibly smart, really quirky, creative people who like to speak their mind. And they play off each other creatively, um, intellectually, um, you know, and often in a, in a very humorous way. I mean, you get people going in a newsroom and it's just a delightful place to be in almost every way. 
and the creative energy that flows between people, between editors and reporters, reporters and photographers, producers and editors. It, it you know, nothing can match, uh, uh, you know, the kind of coincidental meetings you will have in a newsroom or being able to stand at somebody's desk and chat with them or, you know, uh, to pick up on coinc coincidental conversations. It, nothing beats that kind of thing. Conversely, working at home is really isolating for people. Uh, I'm sure many of you have felt it. Um, uh, you know, they're basically kind of people who uh, in two different kinds of situations. You may be in a situation where you're quarantining with a larger group of family. Uh, you might have a spouse or a partner or kids. Uh, who are all, you know, also getting used to quarantining. And it can get pretty old pretty quickly as you've got school-age kids who aren't being kept busy and testy partners and all of that. The flip side of that is people who are quarantining alone. And that is really isolating because this isn't a two-week event. This has been going on for a couple of months now, and it will be several more months before it's over. And these pose challenges, especially to creative-minded people that we are constantly trying to confront. And, you know, we're seeing people um, who just need, understandably, human contact, who just need to be talking to people on the phone. I've tried to send emails out every week to the whole group. We've tried to do Zoom staff meetings with a couple of hundred people on it every couple of weeks. Uh, every afternoon, I will try to reach out to anywhere from five to 10 staffers, just checking in on them by email or phone on how they're doing. And other editors and reporters are doing the same thing with each other. And that's really, really important. But I would not underestimate what it means for really smart, creative people to be suddenly broomed out of the room that they know and isolated um, in a you know, specific place. Can you talk a little bit more about the news gathering? So what are the big stories that you guys have gotten lots of traction on and how has the news gathering changed for those stories? Like what stood out? What's... Uh, good questions. Um, so we have, um, first off on the news gathering process, we have made it really clear with everybody who's in the field that um, there is no interview, no bit of color, no situation, no nothing that is worth the risk of exposure to infection. We would much rather have uh, somebody working the phone, um, uh, working email, doing it, working documents, uh, than standing with somebody or in a situation where they're at uh, heightened risk. So uh, we have pushed that point hard. That doesn't mean we have not been in risky situations. We've been in hospitals, we've been behind the scenes, we've been with police, we've been with EMTs, uh, we've been at press conferences, news conferences. Uh, particularly with the governor that tend to get really overcrowded, especially when they're not held at the state house. Um, they're pretty dicey, but we are really pushing the point home to people that there's no bit of journalism that's worth an infection or a, a exposure. Um, that said, uh, I think people are doing really good work and really good work. And we're seeing all sorts of different stories uh, really take hold. Um, and it depends at what point in the pandemic we've been. Uh, right now, the stories that are getting the most read are the stories that are looking to the future and how we get out of this. What's going to happen come Monday? Uh, how the plans might be rolled out? What is the risk of a setback? That kind of thing. Uh, readership is way, way up on those. We're seeing readers uh, show diminished interest in stories about how self-quarantining might affect you know, specific groups or things like that. Um, early on, we're seeing uh, a lot of interest in Biogen. Uh, if you recall, much of what we've seen here in the greater Boston area began with that Biogen conference at the Long Wharf Marriott. Huge, huge readership on that. Uh, one of the first in-depth stories that we did was getting behind the scenes at the Biogen conference. And that story got hundreds and hundreds of thousands of uh, page views, converted lots of people from readers to subscribers. Um, a story that our ideas section did looking at the lessons drawn from Italy, where they were seeing hospitals, healthcare centers being massively overrun. That got huge readership. It's the single most read story in the history of globe.com. Um, but for the most part, 
when we're on point with a sharp story looking toward the future, trying to explain um, you know, specific aspects of this pandemic, that's when we're getting the most readership. You know, there are also situations. We did a story on a, a Boston-based doctor from Beth Israel who went on a trip to Miami with friends and um, the whole group uh, returned to their respective homes infected and um, spread, you know, likely spread the virus uh, to their respective areas. Um, we're seeing lots of readership on that. We're seeing lots of stories, one-off stories that have huge readership. Um, um, is with anything at the Globe, it's really hard to put stuff in a box and say, this is a kind of story that gets a lot of readership. We have a, a, you know, a readership with an eclectic uh, a set of interests, and that's not any different with our coronavirus coverage. People have a pretty broad range of things they're interested in. Yeah, so um, you're reading these stories, and it kind of reminds me. Uh, do, uh, so one of the stories I remember reading from you guys is you guys wrote about the, so I think the youngest coronavirus uh, uh, victim was 30 years old from Alabama. Yeah, it's a great story. Difference between Terrible the story. On that person reporting on a, you know, going to someone's home after a death. Is, is there, can you talk a little bit more about covering that versus covering a normal, you know, death or something? So that story, um, I mean, I'm really embarrassed. Do you remember the reporter on that, Jordan? It's. Um, I wish I did, but I don't. I'm sorry. Uh, I think it was Dugan Arnett and Nesta Ramos. Um, I can look it up real quick if you want. But yeah. I'm almost sure it was those two. But um, look, on a story like that, the challenge is being able to form a relationship um, and build trust on the telephone. And it's a particular person, type of person, type of reporter who can do that. And um, I know, I think it was Dugan in this case. Did you find the bylines? I'm looking at that right now, actually. Still, still working on it, okay. <laughs> but I'll get it for you. Uh, I, they were able to form a bond with this guy's brother right out of the gates and um, uh, only built that bond further when we told the story on the front page of the Globe. Um, oh, I was right. That's thank you, Dan. Um, thank you, Dan. Um, and um, you know, that's the kind of reporting we've had to do. Normally, you'd probably meet the family member, um, ideally, uh, not always, but ideally. And you know, now we just have to use all of our kind of humanity and empathy and build this kind of trust remotely. And uh, can you talk a little bit more about kind of, um, I guess my question would be more about kind of what, um, can you talk more about the different things you guys are doing? So like one of the things you guys are doing is the mechanic. Can you talk more about that? Yeah. Um, so we're trying a bunch of different things. Can I bring up some other stuff besides that? Of course, um, definitely. Um, you know, we've got these um, uh, stories from the front line, uh, stories from the front lines where uh, reporters have been sticking with a nurse and a doctor and uh, uh, a therapist um, uh, who have worked at, uh, were, are working at uh, three different institutions locally and having them tell about their experience in their own words. And that's been really effective. It's gotten really strong readership. Uh, these people are, you know, built up character. They, they are characters unto themselves. We're not getting in their way. We're just letting them speak uh, often to the camera. They're doing videos of themselves and they're doing uh, written submissions. Those have worked out really, really well. Um, we have um, done elegies to the people who have died. Um, obviously we're seeing a massive overrun of death notices in the globe. We used to run seven pages, six to seven pages on Sundays. We had one week, I think it was a week and a half ago, where we had 23 pages. I think this last week was 22 or 23 pages. Those are paid death notices. So we're also uh, picking um, a selection of people who died and writing elegies to them and putting them in the paper every, uh, every few days or so. You referenced uh, something we uh, titled um, uh, The Mechanic um, early on. In the pandemic, uh, we were batting the idea around that at some point people are going to want a distraction to all the incredibly grim news that's unfolding in front of us, the death, the infection, the economic hardship. And we um, uh, kind of 
took a flyer and uh, reached out to some fiction writers, notable local fiction writers, to see if any of them wanted to write a novella in real time that we could publish in a serialized way in the pages of the Globe and on bostonglobe.com. Uh, uh, we were lucky enough to get a really great storyteller like Ben Mesrick to agree to this. Ben is an international bestseller. A lot of his books have been made into uh, really well-known movies. And he wrote this uh, serialized novella thriller in real time to the point where when we published, he was just finishing the end and we were still doing some edits on it as we were starting to publish the beginning. And that's gotten a really, really terrific response. We've had uh, tens of thousands of readers on this. Uh, people are following it by the day. Uh, whenever we launch an email in, in the evening, uh, about between seven and eight o'clock saying that the latest installment has been posted on our website, we will see readership spike up immediately. Uh, often to the you know top three most read things on our site. And we've just gotten a really, really good response from both print readers and digital readers for doing it. I got a question right now just texted to me about the uh, Spotlight team. Has, has COVID-19 changed anything in terms of that, that end, that team, what they're doing? No, it's okay. a really good question. Um, yes, in a lot of ways. Um, uh, early on, Spotlight was just finishing up a project um, that we were planning to publish probably in April um, last month uh, when the pandemic hit. Uh, because of the pandemic, and I can't really get into it, but the project is not as relevant as we would uh, need it to be. In some ways, it's more relevant, so we're, we're keeping the, the subject line, the storyline, but given the events of um, locally and around the world where we've got a lot more work to do on it. But for the duration of the last two months, we've basically taken the spotlight team off of any project and we had put them into the daily mix and asked them to do a lot of dailies, a lot of accountability work. Patty Wen, who is our spotlight editor, has been fully engaged overseeing our hospitals coverage. Um, She's been doing a terrific job. Uh, Spotlight reporter Mark Arsenault and Liz Kowalczyk have, and Rebecca Ostriker have been huge contributors to our regular work. And just next week, we plan to regroup with the Spotlight team and they will um, start to work on their next project, uh, which we already have in mind. We already know what it is. And they'll be regrouping and doing a, a COVID-19 related project that we're really excited about, probably for publication in the next couple of months. Great. Um, let me, I think I'm going to ask you three more questions and then we're going to do the last 15 minutes of people asking questions. Is that okay? Sure. Great. Okay, great. Thank you so much again for everything. Um, the first question I have, I remember I wanted to ask is, so when you talk about those stories of people getting into the hospitals, getting into like the bio labs, how does a reporter prepare for that to get into like those kind of dangerous settings. Meaning what precautions do they take or how did they get in there to begin with? Uh, well, both maybe, <laughs> I guess, more precautions, but. Um, so we, you know, we have, um, um, we have relationships with a lot of these places built up over time. We have reporters who are subject experts. You know, Liz Kowalczyk is a, you know, long standing elite reporter on healthcare delivery in hospitals. So, uh, she has been behind the scenes of Mass General. Uh, they've been very cooperative with us, uh, showing us how they are uh, responding to the COVID crisis and what's going on at the hospital at all levels. She's been over there several times um, with exclusive behind the scenes looks. When she goes over, for the most part, she's not in dangerous places, but when she is, um, I'm presuming that she is getting all the protective equipment that she needs. Now that you're asking this, I ought to go call her and make sure she is, <laughs> but uh, I'm presuming she is or she wouldn't be putting herself in that situation. Same with uh, Felice Fryer at the Boston Medical Center. Uh, Mark Arsenault and Jess Rinaldi, our photographer, have been out with an EMT crew. They did not get as much protection as we had planned on them getting when they were out in that situation and we weren't happy about it, um, but they did get through it okay. Um, again, we're just telling people if 
if there's any risk whatsoever, don't take it. It's just not worth the risk. We need you um, to be healthy and we need to not be transmitting the virus ourselves. Can you talk about the uh, Pulitzer, Pulitzer Prize finalists for the Globe and who they are and what, what's that all about? Uh, so thank you for that question. We had three finalists this year, which was incredibly gratifying. I'm really, really proud of that. We had no winners this year, which I'm really, really frustrated by because it's um, quite frustrating to have three finalists and not come away with a, a winner. You basically sort of defied the odds right there. Um, uh, the three finalists were uh, very different. Um, two of our projects, two of our signature projects from last year were both finalists, which is actually pretty unusual in American journalism to have that, and we're really happy about that. One was something that um, we called the Valedictorians Project, uh, which was a lengthy undertaking by several great reporters, editors, graphic designers, graphic artists. Um, uh, it was led by the reporters, Eric Moskowitz, um, who's no longer with the Globe, Malcolm Gay and Megan Irons. Um, got strong contributions from Jamie Vasnes, Mike Levinson. Uh, we had teams of researchers on that, um, oftentimes co-ops at the Globe and a couple of interns who were helping us out. The thrust of that project was that we went out and found um, the vast majority of valedictorians in Boston high schools between, I think it was 2004 and 2006. Um, and we wanted to see where they were in life and whether they were fulfilling their dreams their goals, uh, did Boston public schools prepare them for success? And what we found for the most part was that um, they were not nearly as far along as they had hoped in life as adults, and they were not as far along as their uh, suburban counterparts who were valedictorians. And um, uh, it was a story that had significant impact, got a lot of discussion around the state. It came just before there was a lengthy debate over uh, school funding formulas and um, equity in public school systems. So it had really strong impact. Uh, the second finalist was um, Nesta Ramos, who is a, a star globe reporter, now an editor. Uh, he had the charge of going to Cape Cod, spending several weeks there on moped, by kayak, bicycle, car, uh, however, and telling us all of the obvious but also subtle impacts of uh, the climate crisis on this iconic uh, piece of American real estate. And he wrote a beautiful, textured, um, scary story on how the climate crisis was very real right now on Cape Cod. And that was a finalist in feature writing. Uh, the Valedictorians Project was a finalist in local reporting. And Aaron Clark, um, who is a brand new photographer, um, is a Globe intern, uh, was looking around for story ideas, photo essay ideas, and came up with this um, uh, family in Maine uh, where, who was, which was homeless and looking for a better situation in life, moving um, out of state, uh, closer to Boston, uh, looking for a home to live in. And they let Erin into their lives with her camera and she chronicled the kind of heartbreaking but unusually inspiring story of this family looking for a better way of life. And uh, some of the photos were just uh, absolutely stunning. And she was a finalist in feature photography. Oh, well, congratulations on the finalist. Maybe next year you guys will get it. Uh, <laughs> I, I hope so. Thank you. All right. So I think I'm going to have Abby help me out with this because unfortunately I'm having computer issues and I'm on my phone. Abby, can you unmute some people who want to ask questions? Do you mind? No problem. Let's see who's okay. up. Who do you want to start with? Uh, so... Well, which question do you want to take first? You want to touch? So I think maybe with? if you just unmute the mic, you can have them ask their own questions. Just because ah, I'm okay. limited on my screen with the phone. Sorry. All right, no worries. Now unmuted. Looks like Susie has a question. Oh, thank you. Um, I want. I had a sideline uh, question. Um, how do you feel about the Globe's role in exposing 
what I would call kind of sub sub stories, um, the situation in Chelsea, uh, a lot of local companies like being repurposed kind of, I don't know, General Motors making ventilators, my own, uh, everyone's been touched by it, but the nursing home saga, um, my mother at 91 um, was positive and miraculously recovered and beat it. Um, and my brother has Parkinson's is in the same nursing home. He's doing very well. He's positive. And my sister-in-law's father, same story. So there are some good uh, outcomes. Nonetheless, um, I think that the globe has really helped expose a lot of problems out there like Chelsea that, you know, people haven't really noticed. And when this, at least the first wave may be through, um, perhaps it will be like sort of a sil many silver linings and the globe, I you know, want to thank for exposing these. Well, I really appreciate the question, and that's remarkable news about your 91-year-old mother in a nursing home being positive and being okay now. That's really terrific. Um, um, look, we're again, there's a fine line between pride and conceit, but we're really, really proud of the role that we've been able to play in the community, and I think that what you're seeing in Boston and around the country is the absolute importance of having a strong news organization in a given city, in a given region, because, you know, and it, it, take the Chelsea story, for example. Um, the people of Chelsea, the leaders of Chelsea were begging for attention. Um, they were saying that they were the epicenter of so much of the COVID crisis and there, they were really, really uh, off that the state, in their view, wasn't giving them the attention they needed. And that was a place where the Globe could put some of our best reporters over there. We're on the streets over there. We're talking to leaders. We're showing examples of what was going on. And it really, really mattered. Um, um, it, it got them medical attention, um, and it got them political attention. It got them you know, better testing. You know, another case of this, another example of this is the uh, soldier's home in uh, Holyoke, um, where the Globe has played a key role in exposing the problem and then the reason the problem uh, might have uh, arisen. And we've stayed on that story. Again, it's um, gotten a lot of attention. There are multiple investigations now unfolding on what went wrong there. Uh, you know, one nursing home after another in this state uh, where we've come in and thrown attention at it. And uh, what we get are calls and emails from people time and again saying they have family members in these homes. They're unable to get information in any other way aside from getting it in the Boston Globe. And they really appreciate it. So it just shows the value of a, a strong metropolitan news organization like the Globe, but I can repeat this in any other city uh, that has a good strong paper, but I appreciate the question. Next question. I'm gonna actually, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna mute you all and then unmute you. If you could just raise your hand with the icon in the corner, um, that would be great. And then <coughs> unmute you individually just because we have a lot of background noise going on. So hold on, I'm gonna mute you all for one moment. Thank you. Oh, yeah. All right, so um, you are now unmuted, uh, Mr. McGrory. So uh, which question would you like to take next? I saw that uh, uh, Mr. Dan Kennedy uh, asked to have his video uh, restored. Um, if you have a question, please just type it in the chat. Or somebody can just ask it if they want, right? Yeah, just yeah. ask it your mic. I think Dan has his hand raised. Okay. Can you want to be Dan? Yes. Hold on one second. Thank you. Sorry. These are... Uh, are you still muted? Well, I'm still muted. Okay. Yeah, all set. There you go, Dan. Okay. First of all, Brian, thank you for doing this. I, I know you're all insanely busy over there and we all really appreciate it. And I also wanna say I was definitely rooting for the valedictorian project to win the Pulitzer because some of our Northeastern students worked on it and, uh, and did a great job. Um, I wanted to ask you what you think it is about Boston that 
we have been able to sustain um, good local news coverage. Obviously, the Globe is able to do something bigger and more comprehensive than any of the other news organizations, but uh, the two public radio stations are doing a, a good job, Commonwealth Magazine, uh, the TV stations have been substantive and good. Um, what do you think it is about Boston? Um, it's a good question, Dan, and um, uh, let me um, just second that point about, we got a lot of really, really important help from students at Northeastern and other co-ops uh, on the Valedictorians project. It, that, that project would not have been possible if not for the research that uh, uh, was a foundation under it. So uh, if anybody uh, in your classes uh, uh, was part of that, I hope that they feel pride in this Pulitzer finalist because they were a big, big part of it. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, you know, I often say, actually I always say, um, in not in any sort of glib way, that the Globe has the most sophisticated readership of any metropolitan newspaper in the country. Uh, we're just a really smart uh, region, and we're smart in a few ways. I mean, there are a lot of, um, you know, really um, uh, uh, intellectually creative people in this uh, region, but there are also just a lot of street smart, savvy people as well. You don't have to be, you don't have to have a college degree to be smart here. Bostonians is a rule. We just have, we're, we're, we're a sophisticated uh, corner of this country. And I think that that allows us to support a lot of good journalism. Um, uh, and I agree with you on every front. I think uh, WGBH and WBUR have done some really, really great work uh, on this crisis. And, you know, we, I've learned a lot by listening to them. Um, uh, they've just done good journalism. I think the television stations, as you point out, have risen to the occasion. Um, uh, I, I, this is not a knock on the people of the Herald. I think the Herald under you know, hedge fund ownership has been um, uh, a shame. I wish that uh, their owners would invest more in it because you know, the Herald is, up until very recently, a very important part of this community. And, um, I wish they would uh, put more money into it to allow really great reporting over, or more really great reporting over there. Um, I do think that um, we're a smarter region than many others. We're a more sophisticated region. We're a region in terms of uh, the globe that is willing to pay for a high quality news report. That's a really big distinction. Uh, we're able to charge um, a full subscription price of $360 a year for a digital subscription to the globe. Most other newspapers in the country, including the Washington Post, are basically charging well under $100 for a digital subscription, often well under $50. And um, that allows us to support a newsroom the size of what we have. I think people in GBH and BUR are uh, far more likely to contribute money um, in the name of good journalism. And I think that really, really matters. And you know, Commonwealth Magazine has the support of um, a lot of uh, uh, prominent individuals and uh, organizations, and I think that really matters. So I just, I think it's a credit to Boston, but I also think it's um, symbiotic, where the more good journalism you give them, the more they appreciate it, and the more they want it, and the more they're willing to support it. And I think that goes around and around. And I think it's a really, it creates a really vital ecosystem here where you know, quite bluntly, we just produce better journalism in greater Boston than almost any other part of America. I mean, would you, you wouldn't disagree with that point, would you? No, I, I agree with it completely. And I, I see what's around there elsewhere. And, you know, you can pick a few areas here and there that are doing okay. But we all know that um, regional and local newspapers have absolutely been decimated by this <laughs> elsewhere uh, since the pandemic hit. And many of them were not doing well even before that. There are, there are cities that have really good papers. Minneapolis, the Minneapolis yes. Star Tribune is a really good newspaper. Um, Seattle has done really, really well in this crisis. They were the first major city that was hit hard. They've done really, really well. They also just won a Pulitzer Prize this year for an investigation to Boeing. Um, Philadelphia is strong. Dallas is generally strong. San Francisco is good. But... 
I got to tell you, you know, uh, Los Angeles is obviously a very, very good newspaper. They're a very, very good paper. Um, but they've had their own hiccups in terms of ownership and all of that. But uh, they're a strong paper. Okay, so I see that um, we have two hands raised and we have Allison trying to ask a question. How about we just take those three, the two hands raised and Allison, and that'll be it. How does that sound, Abby? That sounds good to me. Yes, let's okay, have Allison. Great. Allison, are you ready? Oh, can, you, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Hi, I was an intern last summer at The Globe. Now I'm a local government reporter at the Charlotte Observer. Oh, I'll make my video <laughs> visible. I'm curious um, for you. So you were talking a lot about um, being forward looking and what does recovery look like? What do next stages look like for Bostonians? I'm curious, I'm um, just for Charlotte and Charlottean looking when is the time to be retrospective and looking at how leaders handle these challenges that, as you said, it's very unprecedented at times. There was no playbook for it. But as local leaders here really uh, dabble around and do we need a field hospital? Do we need to stay at home order? When is the time to hold them accountable and to use that fair metric that they really have no other benchmark to compare how their actions should have played out? It's such a great question. It's one we wrestled with early on, especially. Um, what I would say to other editors at the Globe and what other editors were saying too, is that in the throes of the onset of this pandemic, the Globe didn't want to come across as being the local scold, wagging its finger at officials or, you know, um, uh, kind of the corporate elite for doing the wrong thing um, in the heat of the moment in an unprecedented situation. But we did want to justifiably hold people accountable for actions that just weren't going well. So, you know, oftentimes early in this, we were hitting the administration, the Baker administration, pretty hard on a lack of transparency and their failure to get out into the public realm that communities needed, people needed to figure out were they safe. And, you know, for the most part, we we're winning those battles, but we didn't want to uh, practice anything that even resembled gotcha journalism. We wanted to be very judicious in the way we approach things. Now, the story has changed. And the story has changed. I do think to your point, this now, the global news organization, and I'm sure we do a review of whether the right decision was made in these times. And also through the lens, the prism of not much prepared for this. Um, there is an opportunity to go back and look and see, um, see how things worked out or didn't work out. And up here in Boston, there's a legitimate question to ask. Um, as well as we have done with the social distancing and making sure that hospitals weren't overrun, there is a legitimate question to ask about why is it that the most advanced healthcare city in America has seen one of the highest death rates? And uh, we, we are asking that question and um, um, we'll continue to ask that question and we'll continue to report on it. But uh, um, you brought up some really, really good points. Thank you. So it looks like we have... Uh... San, uh, Sandy and two other questions. Can we just do quick rapid round kind of uh, fast questions? Is that possible? So it looks like Sandra can't ask her question aloud. Do you want to read that, Jordan? Yeah, can you read it out loud for her? Oh, I can do it, yes. Uh, so you. I'd like to know how the globe decides what COVID stats to put on the front page. Seems like for a while, the two graphs of cases and deaths have been the main data pictured, but wouldn't other stats be more useful in knowing where we are on the curve, like new hospitalizations, number of people in the ICU, infection rate, amount of testing, uh, the number of cases has so much to do with testing and deaths and, and death numbers are a trailing, are a trailing indicator. Um, also the death numbers reported each day with little context as to whether it was higher or lower than the day before. Could you comment on how to decide which, how you, decide on which stats to emphasize. 
So th th those are really good questions. Um, early on, we did go with infections, then we added deaths in when we started seeing deaths. I mean, it's hard to believe, but uh, the first death here didn't occur until, what, second, third week of March, I forget which now, but um, um, we wanted to be consistent with the statistics we put on the front page, but online um, and in the body of the story, we have, been presenting a much bigger range of these numbers. And to your point, um, and again, it's a really good question, the key stats here are um, in terms of fear that we're, we're not going to level the, so, you know, flatten the curve. Key, key stats are um, the infection rate, which, you know, is a factor of how many people who are tested on a given day are shown to have infections. The hospitalization rate as compared to uh, what our capacity is. Um, those are much more important than the overall infections and um, overall deaths. So we have been highlighting those um, uh, in the stories and on our website in separate graphics. Um, but we did want to have some continuity on the front page in terms of um, you know deaths and overall infections. It's not like those are unimportant, I think, for public perception. The number of deaths that are occurring are really, really important. Um, today, it was bizarrely low. It was, what, 33 or something like that. That's the lowest we've seen in a long, long time. Um, uh, in deaths, you know, it's a lagging factor rather than a leading indicator, but it still tells you where we are or where we were recently. Um, and, you know, we've seen a decline in the amount of testing that's been done so far this week. That is partially explaining the lower number of infections, but we're also closely monitoring the infection rate, and that is down uh, as well. We have a lot of great questions, so we're just going to take one more just because of time. Uh, so Mary, can you ask your question, please? Yes. Uh, I've been watching these programs. I'm not a journalist. I'm a rehabilitation psychologist with a PhD. Uh, I think one of the big stories relates to the deterioration of the president's mental health, which plays out day by day in very obvious fashion. And I'm wondering why the, you know, major newspaper from, uh, I come from Boston actually, although I'm located in Syracuse, New York now, but I'm wondering why uh, the major newspapers aren't covering this. I mean, I'd like to tell you what I see. It, it reminds me very much of what I've read about the final days of Richard Nixon's administration, where he was raging in the White House. And, you know, what we see now is um, the um, narcissism with which most everyone agreed that he started his administration has deteriorated over these three years to intense, all consuming paranoia. I mean, he's literally said lately all the newspaper people are against him. He seems to have slipped into delusions like, uh, for example, people are treating me worse than they treated Abraham Lincoln. He is up late at night raging on Twitter. Um, my understanding is that his people had to stop him from his two-hour ramblings but from my perspective, this is the excess verbiosity of someone who is in the process of deterioration. He has uncontrolled anger. He stormed out of something with two women reporters, apparently today or yesterday. He is preoccupied with defending himself. And he is, his lies are, you know, indicative to me. When you lie long enough, you start to believe these lies. And, you know, at this point in time, I am wondering if he's pretty far out of contact with reality. And, you know, as I watch him on television and online, it just seems to get worse every single day. So my question is, why are you not covering this? It's so completely obvious, at least to me. So uh, I think I would, um, well, I understand the points you're making. I think I would disagree with the premise that we're not covering it. And, um, uh, and I'm not sure if your point is the news media in general not covering it or the Boston Globe not covering it, but I think take them both. Um, I think it's a lot more effective to show on video or in a factual news story his behavior, especially uh, in two venues, one on Twitter 
and the other in these White House briefings that were for a few weeks a daily event than it is to express opinion column after opinion column or news stories that are overly opinionated. I think when you have a situation where the president behaving as he is, the single most effective thing that the news media can do is just show the public what he's doing and what he's saying and how he's behaving. And I think that in, is what the news media is doing. I think they're doing it very effectively. I can't imagine how many clicks the video got yesterday of him berating or, or telling a CBS reporter that she should go ask China and then walking out of his own news briefing. Um, it's important that the public see that. And um, it's much more important that the public see that than a reporter or columnist say it's not good. Um, I think we're seeing the impact of this. I think we're seeing his declining poll numbers. Uh, they're not just declining, they're, they're dropping. And uh, that's almost making things worse for him. It uh, seems to be exacerbating his behavior. But I think there are times when you don't want to put a strong filter on it. You just want to show the public exactly what's going on and let people make up their own minds. Thank you for that, Mary. So, uh, uh, Brian, I want to thank you so much for your time uh, today. And thank you again for dealing with the, us and our te technical difficulties. And thank you, everyone. Uh, before I let you go, can you just, uh, do you want to say, you give a message to readers and journalists and editors right now? What would you want to say as a final thing uh, for advice well, for them? Uh, first, Jordan, I want to say thank you to you uh, for helping to set this up and to Adam for helping to set this up. I really appreciate the invite. It's always great to be on with other journalists. So thank you so much. Thank you for the great questions. These were really, really smart questions and thoughtful questions. So thank you for that. You know, I would just say to the journalists who are out there, you really are part of history right now. And this is a difficult thing to get through because you know it's personal as well as it's professional. It's a bizarre time in all our lives. But you will look back on this someday with a whole lot of pride and it will feel better in retrospect than it does right now. And to be a meaningful part of this story, to be covering this story in the way you are, is just it's, it's just a really important thing you're doing for, for your communities right now. So we appreciate that. And stay with it. And uh, thank you for having me here. Thank you again. Uh, everyone, this was a Society of Professional Journalists event. Next week, we'll be having Dan Kennedy on. And see you then. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Brian. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you again. Bye.